What's going on, guys? BSOC, last uh, stream of 2017. Um, this has been an absolutely monumental, and I do mean monumental project to be working with you guys. Everybody joining us online, tier one, tier two, tier three, thank you guys for joining us live. We're super excited for tonight to wrap up. Um, what I feel like, and I don't know how you guys feel, or you guys feel, but the goal of this whole project, and I have probably reiterated this like five times, but let's do it one more. The goal of this whole project was to give you guys a really strong clarity of scope throughout the growing season and how we handle our bonsai trees in all of these differing seasons, these differing months, and little snapshots or tidbits of work we can be, should be, need to be doing, things we should be, can be, and would be best to know we need to be aware of, right? And I don't know, I, I'm, I'm kind of curious before we start uh, if you guys could just share maybe one or two pieces of information that you felt like was particularly valuable. Everybody's like, <laughs> be thinking about it at the end of this conversation. Let's do that. How's that? How's that? Okay. All right. I'm going to call on you, so be thinking. Okay. Um, so as opposed to starting off with a lecture tonight, I just want to dive in with a little bit of work to kick this off. I brought um, this very wonderful native larch to North America. This was collected up in the far outskirts of northern Canada in a place where if you go and your car breaks down, you're probably not going to make it back. And it's been a tree that we've been continuing to refine and refine and refine and refine. Now, we actually did um, uh, some larch pruning in terms of mid-season pruning after that first big plush, uh, flush. Those new buds come out, they elongate, we allow them to recumulate that energy, and then we prune them, right? Now, how many here have larch? Larch, big deal, right? Particularly in the Northern Hemisphere, I'm sure if there's Europeans online watching, right? Larix is a big part of European bonsai. Not as massive of a species in Japan. When we're talking about larch, we know that if we fertilize and we drive larch forward, we get flush, 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 flush. We get that growth, right? And we've got to be thinking, how do we handle that? Because we're pruning it almost blind when that growth is elongating in the spring and through that growing season with all that needle mass on it. You guys have that same experience? So now, after all of our deciduous trees' leaves have fallen off, typically the larch tend to come a little bit later. They're a little bit more tolerant to that cold. They're hip to the dip. They know they can handle it. They got a lot of sugar starch loading as a deciduous conifer. We now see the larch starting to drop their needles. And we did that pruning on the deciduous tree, once it was losing its color, needles were, or, uh, excuse me, foliage was spent. We went in, pruned from that big elongated shoot back to two to start to push that apical dominance into those two refinable tips. Where there was one, there's two, okay? Larch is no different. Now, the interesting thing about this is I've already done a majority of the pruning on this tree, but what I wanted to come back and talk to you guys about, we, it seems like we talk about pruning from this very gross, like this was this long, I cut it back to there. Okay, good, but what about all of those structural figurative pieces of pruning that we tend to maybe potentially and oftentimes neglect in our larch? For example, here we have this kind of big, thick, rigid structural piece here, and we've got these two pieces originating from that same junction of that branch, right? Here we have two opposing pieces and a very big, thick, rigid piece with some finer ramification at the tip. Which one of these do we keep? Which one of these do we want to save? How do we find that value in larch? This is a great season to be coming back and looking at larch, addressing them, so that we don't put this work off until next spring as we're repotting and all of a sudden spruce are starting to push and our larch are starting to push and our deciduous are starting to push and we're like, oh my gosh, I gotta get to all of this, okay? So I just kinda wanted to walk you guys through not necessarily the horticultural pruning process, but the structural pruning process as well as when you're thinking about this, how to take design into uh, consideration when we're pruning a larch. So let's kind of start up here at the apex and just take a look at this. I recognize this is a small tree. Thank goodness we've got Ricardo on the uh, camera. And I did a small tree just because uh, I knew that you guys would have to look really hard and couldn't fall asleep to stay engaged, right? Okay, so we've got this area here where we've got these two branches here and then this big thick coarse tip. Can you guys in any way, shape or form see that? Yeah, yeah, let me show you, let me show you. Okay, I'm gonna come back around. Put my hand behind it, let's try that. All right, here we go. Ah, oh, wrist, wrist, ah! Okay, so let's, let's, let's talk about this real quick though, okay? 
So we've got this inner node. We've got this place here where we have two pieces of ramification here. We've got this juncture here, and we've got this juncture here, right? Now, with a larch, when we're looking at this, we would say, ah, oh, which one should we remove? If we're just pruning just, just off of what we've been taught by the book, this is how we prune. Which one should we prune? Well, oh, so we're looking from the top down. It's a good call, though. I, I was with you guys on that one. I was there. I was there in spirit. Which one should we prune? Still the bottom. Well, what's the difference between the bottom and the top now? If, it's, if we're top down, do we, we prune this one? We prune this one? Do we prune this one? Right, yeah, no, but this is, this is the whole discussion, right? Because we talk about, oh, man, we got this big, long branch. I'm going to cut it back to two buds, and boom, 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 we're going to get this ramification. But at this time of year, after we've been pruning in the blind all season, when we drop these needles and we come back to make a better larch, or make a better bald cypress, or make a better Don Redwood, these deciduous conifers, they behave a little bit differently, right? And we get this con a congregation, this accumulation of growth that starts happening. We've got to be able to make those decisions to be able to continue to refine this tree. Otherwise, it gets coarser and coarser and coarser and coarser. And this is what we generally see as the ramification on our larch, is extremely coarse pieces of growth, OK? So when we're looking at the apex here, right, I've got all of this other growth happening in the central portion of the apex. I've got this piece that's starting to ramify into these beautiful, refined pieces of growth. I've got this, this guy pointing to the interior, and this guy pointing. Notice what's happening here. It's pointing into this very massive negative piece of space here. Do you see that? So when I start to look at this, and when we start to prune, one of the things that I hope over the course of, this, uh, of these workshops or uh, Mariah Live sessions that we've had at Bonsai, uh, or at BSOP, Bonsai, BSOP, OK? Uh, th that I hope we've been able to dispel is the automatic, right? So what I was anticipating you guys saying is, well, you cut the strongest middle one out, and you didn't. If I had a present to give every single one of you, I would, right? I'm so proud of you guys, OK? But when I'm looking at this now, I'm saying, oh, let's take away that one that's growing into that space where we have all of this other ramification that's occurring, right? So now we're creating and we're utilizing the pruning process to manage that distribution of foliar mass. Does that make sense? OK, so now that we made that pruning choice so that we have this moving into this negative space, we kept this more highly ramified quality tip that's not overly coarse, we move to this section where we've got three branches existing in one single inner node. This one's moving towards the front. OK, cool, maybe. right? This one's kind of come up, and it's starting to ramify as a little bit of a more structural piece. This one's moving back to the interior of the tree. Right here. Which one of these do we prune? This one? So how do we build this if we don't keep these? That's not a loaded question. I'm just curious. I want to make sure. As long as you can keep the pad. What do you got, Paul? We do need those. We need that height there. We do need those. Do we want this big coarse piece here? That's a Can we get a mic over there? Right. Yeah, let's get a mic over there. That's a good question. That's a good question. And we start looking at this. We've got to reason through, because we just made a choice. We just started the waterfall. Ah, all right. Now what? Because this big piece now, if we prune this out, now we've created this big gaping hole in our apical region, right? Did you want me to repeat? Yeah. Repeat? Yeah. Are there any two that complement each other? Is there one that doesn't look right in comparison to the other two? Well, and I think this is the whole, uh, I think that's a great question, but this is the whole point. How do you make these decisions? What's the goal when we start pruning in terms of distribution of branching? Even distribution, even distribution. So do we want even distribution throughout this tree? We, what do we want that even distribution? In the branch, yes, yes, nice, Scott, OK? So when we look at this, I've got this other very beautiful structural piece right here that's already starting to ramify, right, has a lot of, ramification building on it. I've got this big piece that's kind of growing in where I've got other buds set, it up, set up right here on this interior. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to take this off because I've got these pieces to give me that even distribution. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to shorten that guy so that I start to transition that strength, just like we did with the deciduous, back into the interior. Okay. So the purpose in showing this to you guys to start off this stream is to say, hey, listen, we've been through this kind of nuts and bolts mechanics of how we handle bonsai across the seasons.
but a lot of that has been void to some degree of the aesthetic considerations that we're constantly trying to maximize our trees, right? And when we come right back to it, once we get those horticultural components that allow us to have control over our trees, right, we always have to come back to that concept that we're trying to create something beautiful, something well-formed, and something defined in our bonsai. Does that make sense? You feel comfortable? Larch, from one to two, fixing structure, trying to evenly distribute that branching throughout the crown. All right, I'm gonna keep going. I'm not, I'm not gonna stop there. You guys are like, wait, that's it? Really, are you serious? Okay, so then let's keep talking through this, all right? We've got these branches down in this area here. We've got these big, long pieces. Now, notice how fine. Notice how fine that piece is, right? When we look at the apical region, we see all of these big, coarse pieces of growth, yeah? Why are those so coarse, and why is this so fine? What happened? I, hmm? Okay, hang on. Too much nutrients made the big ones thick. Why did this one stay so fine? It got shaded out. That's an interesting idea. If it were shaded out, I wonder if it would have this type of ramification. What happens with shade? We get it leggy, it elongates, right? And this is very, very tightly ramified. I'll pass this around if you guys, are you guys interested? Yeah, you wanna see it? Yeah, yeah. Okay, right? Why is that such a high quality, it's right by your right foot. Why is that such a high quality piece of growth? Why is it so fine? Talk to me about that. Okay, hang on. Energy, I'll repeat it. Energy was not diverted there. But it, but it elongated and it had all these buds. What the heck? What else could have happened? Late growth. And why do you say late growth would create finer growth? Because you already pruned it and it grew again. This is what happens with a larch, right? And when we start to talk about refinement of a larch, refinement of a larch, refinement of our elongating species, refinement of a deciduous conifer, refinement of a de deciduous tree in general, hinges on the container constricting that root environment that creates all of that take up of water and nutrition, okay? But what happens here is we get towards the end of that spring growing season. We've had flush after flush after flush after flush. We have all of that stored energy in the tree. We're pruning, it's pushing again. We're pruning, it's pushing again. We're pruning, it's pushing again. By the tail end of that growing season, we've pruned, and it's starting to say, man, I'm about empty, right? And that's when we get the most refined growth possible, right? And this is the beautiful thing that we can start to understand about how we manage our bonsai trees, is if we allow or we work that tree to get that growth and to get that strength and we manage it and we manage it and we manage it. That last time we let those nice, beautiful, fine branches run out with that limited amount of strength, that's when we get these tips on a larch that start to give us the very highest quality piece of ramification, right? And this is a very major technique to be coming back and looking at now because we come back in with all of those tight inner nodes of that branch that's either lost or rotating around somewhere, right? And we can prune back to that interior tight growth. And this is happening across the tree. So I'm pruning back to two, directionally pruning back to two, pruning back to two. I'm going to be pruning back to two, pruning back to two. I'm going to come in here on any of these guys on the interior that are offering me the ability to create that nice fine ramification if they're not where I want them to be. I'm going to go ahead and leave them because that's what's going to create this crown and start to fill out in this really beautiful ramified way. Pruning back to two, coming in here, pruning back to two, Pruning back to two, this is how we set the stage for next year where there was one, there will be two. Does that make sense? Okay. And we can do that very, very effortlessly at this time of year. Doug, you had a question back there. From the original ah. uh, branch cutting, it was the middle choice of the three? We took off that choice. What, what's that? We took off that choice, okay. this one because there were other branches over here, right? In terms of distribution of branches. Yeah, I was just clarifying. Gotcha, gotcha. Lime, we got Paul up here. Do we have any questions online? No. No? Good, cool, all right. So after you get that uh, late flush uh -huh. that is better ramified, do you now wanna remove the coarser branches? Sure. Sure, right? And so this also becomes one of the major considerations because when we step in here now, 
For example, I'm going to rotate this. You guys are going to have a hard time seeing it. I understand that. You'll be able to watch it online. Okay. Now we've got these two beautifully fine branches here, and we've got this very big, thick, coarse piece. If we have the ability to maintain this silhouette with those finer pieces and eliminate that coarser piece, this is now that perfect time to come back in and take that off. Okay. So just so that you guys can see it online, we have this big, thick, beefy, coarse piece that doesn't have any ramification created on it. We've got these two very fine pieces here. We take that off, and this is that wonderful time to transition. Exactly right. OK? All right? We good with Larch? All right, let's dive into winter care. OK, so we talked about last time winter preparation. We talked about winter storage. We talked about what the trees were doing. Let's talk about winter care a little bit. And one of the things that really caught me off guard about our stream last time was the fact that so many questions about winter came flying from the internet, from you guys. It was wonderful. The first hour of that stream was questions, OK? And I thought, oh, man, we haven't even started to break into this, OK? So let's just gain a little bit more knowledge about winter care as we're moving into it. And first thing I want to talk about in terms of winter care is wind. What do we do about wind? What in the world do we do about wind? Can't blow against, can't blow against the wind. Yeah, it's true. Don't pee into the wind, right? OK. What do you do about wind? Is it a big deal? It's kind of wet. I don't know. It's cold. It's, it's a big deal, right? This is a big deal. Now, why is wind a big deal? Desiccates, desiccates. And what does desiccation mean? All right, freeze dried. It removes water from what? From the foliage mass, absolutely, right? So we have these trees that are out in the cold. We've got frozen temperatures, which means the roots don't have a liquid to be taking in to replace that water content. We got this wind that's just raging across our bonsai collection, and we're sitting inside, right? Hot cocoa, fireplace. We're like, nah, it's cold out there, OK? And we're hoping that our trees are going to be OK. What are some of the best things that we can do to help our trees endure wind? Let's start at that high impact, or that low impact, and kind of carry our way through, just the same as we started with kind of a cold shelter, and then we went to a greenhouse, and then we went to the full-scale thing. What's one of the easiest things we can do to protect our trees from desiccation? OK, so put them on the ground, absolutely, right? Number one, put them on the ground. OK, what else can we do in terms of protecting our trees from the wind? OK, build a wall. Absolutely. Let's say that's a little more involved. Let's even go a little bit more low, low impact in terms of protecting from wind. Cover the trees with straw. Use a wall that exists. What if we bunch our trees together? Have you guys ever heard about that? Right? You, know, you see cattle in those big, huge blizzards, and they're all kind of hanging together. And they're like, oh, man, we're helping each other here. Okay. One of the biggest things that you guys can do, because we typically tend to get a, a high amount of wind for a very short period of time, Building a big wall, building a structure, moving all your trees in and out, that becomes very, very precarious. Simply grouping, grouping our trees so that the trees themselves create a solidified unit that the wind can't pass through and remove the moisture from the canopy of the tree. One of the single most important things that we can do to help prevent this very significant winter issue that can cause a lot of problems for our bonsai, right? And not a lot of people talk about this. Now, typically, when we talk about grouping, we say, no, you want to spread them out. You want air to move through the branches. Yes, I, I understand. This is that special situation where there's too much air. Very rarely in bonsai are we ever going to say too much air. You got too much air, right? This is one of those moments where we got too much air. OK? Yes, sir. Uh, we need a mic over there. And while we're talking about that, we're saying build a wall. Build a wall. Now, what's one of the dangers of building a wall? OK, the wall falls over. That would be a poorly built wall. <laughs> that would be a poorly built wall, but I hear that, right? That would suck. OK. What, what is another danger of building a wall? Shade. Very good. We talked about it last time. And what do we know happens over the winter season that we've got to continue to facilitate if we possibly can? What is that? OK, so we continue to photosynthesize. And remember, we continue to increase our cold tolerance over the course of the winter via that sugar and starch loading until we get to that coldest portion of the year, January, and our trees are like, hey, we're all good. Sugar and starch heavy right here, OK? What was, yeah, what do you got? When you group your trees together, do you want to put your pines and junipers in the middle or on the outside? I would say, well, let's think about that. This is a good question. When we group them together, what goes in the middle? What goes on the outside? 
and why? How, how do you guys make sense of this? Juniper's in the middle, and why, Doug? Okay, vascular system needs to be protected during the cold, maybe, all right, what else? What do you got, Scott? I would put the deciduous in the middle because they have fine branches that can easily dry out. Okay. Because they're not actively metabolized. Deciduous in the middle because their fine branches could dry out. Oh, very interesting, interesting. What's the most durable species we probably have to wind? Pines. Pines, right? And why do we say pines are so durable to the wind? Tough cuticle, the, the needles, right? So we have a low surface area in the formation of the needles. We've got a very thick cuticle, which is what makes that needle so rigid, right? Pines should be on the exterior of your grouping in order to protect your trees from heavy winds. So we would say, in the middle, our most fragile deciduous. Outside of those are junipers that have an extremely high surface area and a very thin cuticle as domesticated bonsai. And around those, we'd be using our pines. And we want to be very specific about the direction of the wind. Because if we're using our pines as a wind block, right, then we want to have those at the orientation where the wind is hitting the group. Does that make sense? Very few people talk about wind in the wintertime, and so many trees are lost to this problem. Crazy. Bishop has a question. What do you got, Bishop? Um, Bishop wants to know if there's a certain temperature that we need to worry about with wind. Once it starts freezing, we got to worry about wind, right? Because now that the roots are impaired from taking in that liquid to replace what's lost, we need to be protecting it from being lost. And that's the whole point. We got uh, questions over here. Slime. Gentleman in the uh, green sweater. So the junipers live in the high desert plains where the wind blows all the time. True. Hard. Absolutely and the true. The pines live in all sorts of different places, maybe on the coast, maybe in the, in the mountains, and that, where they're sheltered <clears throat> by the winds. And I'm curious as to why the pines go outside and protect the junipers. Ah, uh, that's a really good question. Why, right, junipers are out on the high, high desert, right? They're getting hammered by wind. Pines, I would also say, hammered by wind, particularly if you look at bristlecone, uh, lodgepole, limber, and ponderosa, or shore pine on the coast. They're absolutely getting mutilated by wind. Why, though, pick the pines over the junipers? What happens when we take a tree out of the wild and we bring it in and start cultivating it with all the fertilizer and water it needs as a bonsai? It starts to produce that really beautiful, vigorous foliage. We thought we had Itoyagawa coming off the mountain. We thought we had a special cultivar of junior juniper. It's so small. It's so tight. And we start watering it and fertilizing it, and all of a sudden it turns into medusa, right? We get the af, and we're like, whoa. That foliar type would not survive that same condition that that tree came from, right? That's the fat and happy couch potato foyer type. That's like, I made my money. I'm done with work, right? <laughs> okay? And so when we look at that, that foyer type without that thick cuticle and that smaller surface area that existed on the mountain becomes highly susceptible. But pine needles do not change. Pine needles never change their form. They never change their shape, and their cuticle also does not change. So when we think about that, pines are easily just as durable and domestic as they are in the wild environment, and this is why it works, okay? Paul. Trees that you've been uh, working on that need special protection and care, do they go into the deciduous circle? So if we have trees we've worked on past that point where freezing conditions are not gonna be safe for that tree, they shouldn't even be in this conversation, right? But most of us know that we've got too many trees to fit inside our greenhouse, and so we're trying to figure out all of the other things that need to be happening over the course of winter in that winter care routine that we're creating. How do we handle those when we get these really odd anomalies that are the winter time, particularly in the Pacific Northwest, but across the entire region? And this is a question that we've gotten time and again on the Q&As on Mirai Live. And it's very important to understand that. So those trees that aren't ready to be out in freezing weather should be in protected area altogether, OK? We got another question. We got a question here, and we got a question back there. Winter time. I'm telling you guys, I love this. This is great. Who's ever talked about winter? Ryan, uh, when you're grouping them, uh -huh. uh, what is the uh, most efficient format as far as what needs to what needs to be done? What the balance between protecting them? as far as bunching them together and also being able to do what you need to do with them. Yeah, 
what is the most efficient? Well, I would say if we can potentially group them in a way that when we spread them out again, we don't have to do it all over multiple times or move them a great distance, that would be the most sensible, right? So for us, all of our trees go on a ground kind of near a wall. That forms a natural windbreak. Down in the container yard, all of our trees are tightened up into a tighter group so that they can endure the cold and wind a little bit more, okay? So if we can create those small little steps to make this more efficient over the winter season, you guys can stay in sipping hot cocoa, fireplace, all good. You don't need to worry anymore. So as you talk about the freezing temperatures, what about wind chill? Would that be something to consider for freezing of possibly the foyer mass? I mean, wind chill is a real thing, right? And so that's temperature combined with, with, with the wind, yeah? And that's causing that desiccation if we've got that frozen root mass, or that can also cause the root mass to freeze. So absolutely, that's a consideration, right? And if we have that, we need to be looking at protecting, and that's the whole gist of this. When I did this talk with you guys last month, everybody said, you didn't talk about wind. What are you doing? Like, where we're at, wind is the number one factor that trees die, and I was like, ah, winter care. That's an interesting one, okay? So let's wrap up wind. We feel good, we put them on the ground, we group our trees, we build a wall. Number four, put in a structure. That's all good, we got greenhouses. What do you have to worry about with wind in a greenhouse? Does that have to, do you have to consider that? Absolutely, you've got a big sale, right? How do you protect a greenhouse from wind? Okay, ventilation, Scott says. So are we talking about protecting it from blowing away, or are we talking about protecting it from the wind removing the heat? If, the, if it's the wind from removing the heat, that, that double layer to have that airspace, good. If we're talking about it blowing away, are you saying open it up? Scott's saying open it up. What do you guys think? Open it up or close it down? Open? Open? Close? Close? Tie it? In Japan, we used to have this makeshift greenhouse in the front of Mr. Kimura's, and we had these big, huge, like, nylon ropes that you could tie a ship down with. And every year we would have to hoist them over this thing, like 20 of them, right? And then we, I, I thought it was so obnoxious every year. And you'd get them on these little tiny round pegs behind the fence and you'd have to crank it down and it's just sucking all the structure down, right? And you'd tie them off just the way you wanted so it looked all really nice and a pretty bow. And one night, one time I was like, hey, why do we do this? And one of the apprentices goes, like 10 years ago, this thing took off, <laughs> took out the neighbor's window. <laughs> Whole greenhouse lifted off the ground, all the way across the garden, missed all of Mr. Kimura's trees, and took out the window on the apartment building across the way. I was like, wow, OK, that happens, right? So we need to be aware of that. Best way to stop wind from impacting your greenhouse, close it down. Because if the wind can get in and you create that effect, that balloon effect, that's when you start to lose your greenhouse, right? Shut it down, tie it down, call it good. What do you got? Can we get a mic? Isn't it somewhat of a balance, really? Make sure you speak into it. Isn't it somewhat of a balance? Because you can't have it completely stagnant because then you're opening it up for disease, right? So you need some air movement. Let's hope it's not windy for long. And fans inside the greenhouse with the greenhouse closed doesn't necessarily mean the air stagnates, right? right. What happens in the greenhouse stays in the greenhouse. How about that? <laughs> OK. Let's talk about winter water. OK, now there's been a really interesting development as we've been talking about this whole system, right? And we say, OK, we can be pruning our deciduous trees now, and they won't bleed. We can prune our uh, deciduous conifers now, and they won't bleed. And I've had a number of people uh, on the Q&As and, and also students come up and talk to me and they said, I brought my Japanese maple that's now void of foliage. I brought it in, I set it on my table. I started pruning and it started bleeding. Why would that happen? It's fall. It's fall. That should be receding. Why would that happen? Full of water. It's inside. Very good. It's inside. One of the things that is so shocking about bonsai, we think a bonsai stops in the winter. Do we think a bonsai stops in the winter? Good, I hope we've corrected that, right? I hope we've corrected that, because it doesn't stop. Nothing stops, right? If it stopped, then we wouldn't be getting this happening, right? And if it stopped, then we wouldn't see the tree respond like that to temperature. This is the amazing thing. This, this starts to tell us about how our trees are behaving. I bring a tree indoors, it's warm, a maple, I cut it, it bleeds. 
It's responding to that temperature. I bring a pine indoors. I set it on the table. I cut a graft, uh, cut, cut a union to graft, and it starts bleeding sap. Ah, dang it, it's wintertime. It shouldn't be doing that, right? I have a tree, temperatures get into the 40s or 50s. It's not using water. It's wintertime, right? Ah, OK. So we've got to be keen to the fact that these trees are responding like this. Winter, summer, spring, fall, it doesn't change the fact that things do not stop living, right? So when we talk about winter water, we know that all of the factors that generally cause a tree to need water, right? Sun, wind, addition of new growth, these things are not happening with as much rapidity. We clear about that? What is happening throughout the winter if temperatures are capable of catalyzing metabolic activity? What is happening? Root growth. Root growth. And could you believe it? How does a plant create new tissue? What is that tissue made of? What is it made of? OK, sugars and starches drive the process of cellular division. OK, so we're talking about that. That new tissue is H2O and CO2. We know that, right? That's broken down into sugars and starches, which causes the cellular division to take place. And sugars and starches cause the elongation. And sugars and starches cause the differentiation. So when we have new root growth taking place, we think, well, the roots are in the soil. This is, the water's in the soil. And the foliage isn't losing. We're, we should be good, right? This is the number one time that trees die from lack of water is in the middle of winter. That's crazy to say, right? That's crazy to say. How many of you guys have gotten your trees out of the cold shelter in the spring, you set them out, and a tree never buds out, and you say, I don't know what happened. What happened? How? It was in the greenhouse, right? This is what happened. This is what happened, OK? So be very careful. We protect our trees. We love our trees. We're going to put them in the greenhouse. Should be OK. You have to water. Trees that go in the greenhouse continue to grow roots. They continue to utilize water. We should be watering our greenhouses at least once a week in the wintertime. Thorough saturation at least once a week in the wintertime, or else our trees, if we're at those temperatures that catalyze metabolic activity, they will be drying out. Does that make sense? There's a question in the back. Donna's got a question. What do you got? Um, Gaspar is curious um, if the if the substrate in the pot gets frozen all the way down, do they still need to water? Do they still need to water? So this has been a question, too, that's come up a lot. It's frozen. What do I do? Well, the best we can do is put water on that frozen block of ice. And if it percolates in, cool. If it doesn't, not much we can do, right? But what could we do if we were worried about a tree being dehydrated via the wind if we felt like we needed to get it water? Spray the foliage, if the hoses still work. Ice cubes, snow, or couldn't we bring it into an area where it dethawed and water it? Technically, I mean, have we, we ever thought about that? You would take it out of the wind, first of all, right? It defrosts, we rehydrate it, and out, out you go again. Possible, possible. Now, is that actually really practical? No, no, not really. Let's not think about it that way. Let's protect it from the wind in the first place, right? Snow on top of it. Water it if it's frozen. If it doesn't take it in, that's OK. It's already frozen. It doesn't matter, right? Donna, you have a question? I just made a comment. Um, you may get into this, but there's something that's probably killed more plants than we've ever had uh, survive. And that's when we have weather like we're having right now, uh -huh. warm, and all of a sudden, the Arctic comes down. Yeah. What do we do? What do we do? So you're well, saying precautions. warm, and when the Arctic blast comes, that's what yeah, you're saying? They're not hardened. Rapid drop of temperature, that's a big problem, right? What do we do? Put them on the ground. Heal them in. Bunch them up and protect them as best you can. If you got snow, use it. These are the things that we can do. And we all know. We've experienced this. This happens every year in the Pacific Northwest. Okay? Winter care, all I want to talk about. Wind, right? How do we do it? What can we do? How do we battle this or fight this battle? Water. What's using water? How is it using water? Why is it using water? What should we be aware of? And what do we do? Okay? Root growth, water, be aware. You got something? Yeah. David is wondering. What are the different moisture needs for deciduous trees without leaves and evergreens with leaves during right. the winter? Right, right. I mean, generally, do your guys' deciduous trees use water in the wintertime? Yeah. Are they capable of growing roots at the same time? What is perpetuating the root growth in deciduous trees without leaves? 
Stored energy. Stored energy. What is that stored energy? Where is it stored, first of all? Oh, the roots. Oh, no. Where is it stored? Somebody, re 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 come on. Vascular system. Vascular system. Vascular system. This is all of the cells from the trunk to the branches to the tips to the roots. All of it's storing energy, right? That stored energy is going to continue to drive growth if the temperatures that make metabolic activity happen arise, OK? So when we look at deciduous trees, deciduous trees, too, have that stored energy. They, too, can grow roots, right? We need to be aware of that over the course of winter, right? I brought something for you guys. So one of the big things that we talk about a lot is we talk about this idea of bottom heat, bottom heat, bottom heat, right? bottom heat, these heat pads, how do we keep roots growing, how do we protect trees? So uh, Troy, my faithful sidekick, is here somewhere. Thank you, Troy, for creating this. Oh, there we go, for creating this beautiful sample. Right? I wanted to show you guys the structure of our heat pad so that you guys could understand a little bit better and have a visual context. And this is for everybody online as well, because there's a lot of questions that surround this. It makes sense to understand this. Now, please bear in mind, this is cut down to size, because it's a gigantic thing when we bring them in. Okay. So this is heating beds. And what we're doing here with heating beds is we're applying bottom heat. And bottom heat is perpetuating. Oh. Root growth. So say, for example, we have a tree we collected in the fall. We want to perpetuate root growth. We have a tree we repotted in the fall. We want to perpetuate root growth. We have a tree that's shown some difficulty over the course of the season. We want to pr protect it and continue to foster that tree's recovery. We can perpetuate root growth, OK? So this is what we're doing with our heat pads right here. We're setting down first an initial structure, right? An initial structure to be able to protect this whole system from the ground itself, OK? Let me see what I got here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to pull this apart a little bit. I'm going re, to rebuild. OK. Our initial structure that we're setting down is actually this foam. Okay. The foam is what creates kind of that solid level or layer. Now, if we have the foam on the top of the plywood, what ends up happening is the heat from the pads can melt the foam. And if any of you guys have ever seen this happen, it's like, oh, I'm glad my greenhouse didn't just burn down. Right? Okay? So we're putting the foam down as a base layer along the gravel, creates that one layer, also insulates from rapid heat loss moving down into the ground from the heat pads. Obviously, heat goes up. Well, when it's in this confined environment, heat goes down. Okay? On top of that, we want a rigid structure. So we use plywood, good thick, solid three quarter plywood, half inch plywood, whatever you have. Plywood gives us that structure, also not extremely flammable compared to what the foam would be. Okay? On top of that plywood, we're going to put this heat mat. Put the heat mat down. It's designed for horticultural use. These heat mats are quite long. They come in, uh, what is this, four, uh, eight foot sections or six foot sections? Six? Okay, and they're heavy duty. Okay, you guys get these at Oregon Bag Company, OBC Northwest, right? OBCNW.com. You can buy these. Really, really durable. You hook these up to a thermostat. Hook these up to this thermostat right here. You dial in that temperature, plug it to this guy, right? And you can connect four of these in a chain to have an extended heat mat on one single thermostat, OK? So then, on top of that heat mat, we're going to take a high, really thick, construction quality plastic. Right, this is uh, eight mil plastic. We put that over the top to protect the heating pad from all of that water sitting inside of that bed. Okay, we build a wall around this, just a simple wood wall, and inside of it, we put pumice. Okay, now that pumice is one of the most important parts of a heating bed. Why? Diffuses the heat, retains the heat, retains the heat. What else does pumice do? Pumice retains water. Why is retaining water so important? OK. Why is retaining water so important? Water holds heat. Very good. So we're heating 
we're heating the pumice, the pumice is holding the water, right? So we're heating the water, and the water has a higher heat retention capacity than any other element that we could be putting in there to hold that heat around the root mass of that tree. This is how we perpetuate the bottom heat and maximize any of the utilities it costs or takes to run this system, okay? 70 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit will keep your roots growing at a rapid pace over the course of winter time. This is one of the biggest single techniques for winter care that we can implement into our system in a confined environment or a containerized environment to continue to help these trees recover, continue to produce vascular tissue that will help them add foliar mass, and to help them get through that winter season, okay? Does this help? To see it is to understand it, right? Um, we got a question, we had one back there, and then we got another one right here, and we got a boom, 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 gotcha. Uh, what is your uh, stand on uh, lime sulfur, you know, during the winter? Lime sulfur or dormant sprays? Or does that sprays? fit into your program there? Dormant sprays here, let, let me, uh, I'll, I'll talk about that next. What else we got? When you put plants in one of these beds, are they in pots that you are just uh, embedding in the pumice? Or That's a good, are these planted in the pumice? That's a good question. Is it in pots or do you just plant it in the pumice? The answer is yes. Either way, you can plant a tree in pumice on a heat bed and cause it to rapidly reproduce roots, or you could put a tree in a pot on a heat bed and cause it to do the same. Biggest bang for your dollar, if you have the time and you're willing to do it, plant the tree directly in the heat bed. I'll let you guys in on a little secret. Best collector in the world right now, Randy Knight, plants a lot of trees in a heat bed. I'm just, I'm just throwing it out there, right? You do what you want with it. So with the uh, thermostat, what temperature range you set it at? And are you, are you measuring the air temperature or the, the soil, the pumice Good temperature? question. Good question. So with this thermostat, you have this sensor right here, right? If you measure the air temperature and you're heating this to be giving the roots the temperature that you want, we're going to be baking some trees, okay? So we need to have this in the soil at the level of the mat to know exactly what the container is experiencing at that point of contact, okay? I've cooked a fair number of trees in my day. It's best to make sure this does not get dislodged from that system. Because once it pops into the air, this won't stop heating. And you can go, you can take these mats well over 100 degrees very, very easily. Okay? Chris is wondering if you uh, put the little switch in the most sensitive tree. Or which, which tree, do you, which soil do you decide to put it in? So we put it, on, we put it on top of the mat. We have to have the sensor on the mat where the heat is originating. It doesn't matter which tree. We want it at the level of the mat in the heat bed so that that sensor is telling us what this surface is producing heat-wise when it's producing it. And then Lydia's curious if such a high temperature would make those in dormancy start budding. No, this is the magic, right? But here's the kicker. How do we get this tree to produce the maximum amount of roots? We're applying this kind of heat. What's the other caveat to this to make it work? Air temperatures have to be cold. Because once the air temperature rises, the tree foliar-wise starts to say, ah, Yes, I like what's happening here. I'm feeling, this feels good. Let's start rocking out. But if that air temperature is cold and that root zone is warm, the tree is saying, Ugh. but the roots are like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, so cold air temperatures, warm root zone temperatures, energy is focused on root production. Very courteous group you guys are, VSOP community. No, you, no, you, no, you. Please, you. So you, you sort of answered this. I, 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 could you clarify when you're um, overwhelming the dormancy that a tree would normally like? I mean, they go dormant in the winter. Sure. They're not dead. Sure. But they're dormant. Sure. But yet this is growing, encouraging growth sure. where they would otherwise be dormant. It, so there's some, some confusion. You sort of answered it, keeping it cold. Does that mean this is for outdoor is this an outdoor heating pad? Could or, be, could be, right? Typically, in it's used in a, typically it's used in a greenhouse, but greenhouse temperatures are such that if you're trying to keep trees dormant in a greenhouse, you're still 40 degrees or below, right? 42 degrees ambient air temperature typically catalyzes foliar growth, right? That's the one that starts 
ah, we're going to start to move now, right? We keep it below that temperature, and we work really hard in the Pacific Northwest to do so because we get those warm days. We keep it below that temperature. They stay in foyer dormancy. They allocate their resources towards root growth. Now, good question, though. It is still growing. I wouldn't necessarily think trees like to be dormant, OK? But why do trees go dormant? Why, if we take a ponderosa pine and we send it to Houston, Texas, in three years, is it going to die? Why does that happen? What's that? It doesn't go dormant. It doesn't go dormant. But, but what is actually happening if it doesn't go dormant? Carbohydrate exhaustion, very good. It continues to grow. And for our trees that are geared towards the high alpine, they have to have a portion of the year where they stop utilizing carbohydrates. Now, when we put it, or well, we'll say sugars and starches, when we put it on this heat mat, is it still using sugars and starches? Absolutely, absolutely. Do we want to put a tree on a heat mat every single year? No, no, right? Takes a tree three to four years to exhaust sugar and starch supplies. We can sacrifice one year to make that happen. Following year, we need to leave that tree to go dormant. Absolutely, good point. Some folks in the chat are curious if, what, if photo period is more important than temperature. Equal, 50-50, 50-50. When we start getting into trees like, say, uh, Japanese quince, Chinese quince, ume, sakura, or cherries, some of the flowering, some of the deciduous varieties, air temperatures alone or photo period alone, independent of the other, could potentially cause leafing out, flowering, and premature growth. Okay, So we got to be careful with those trees that have a high movement of water and sugars in the, in the vascular system. Those deciduous trees, they can move a lot quicker and respond to temperature a lot quicker. For our, our conifers, photo period plus temperature are going to both be necessary to cause them to move, okay? But that's a great question. What do you got? How does putting a tree on a heating pad affect your feeding schedule? Would you want to start earlier in the spring or push later in the fall? Great question. That's a really, really good question. So we're existing on stored sugars and starches on this heat pad, right? And that's what's inside the tree already. Now, just because it's on a heat pad and the temperatures inside of the container are, are warm at the bottom of the container to catalyze growth, doesn't necessarily mean that the metabolic or, or doesn't necessarily mean that the microbiotic activity is functioning at a rapid pace yet. That, meta, or that microbiotic activity is responding directly to the tree producing sugars and starches and that vascular system moving a lot of resources. So to fertilize earlier, doesn't necessarily make sense because we want the whole tree to be active before we start adding nutrition to that system. All right, that's a great question, though. Yeah, what do you got, Paul? And then we'll go here, and then we're going to move on. Um, if if you got a hey, Paul, talk, talking in the mic. If you got a temperature spike, let's say, goes up to sixty for uh -huh. a day or two, uh -huh. would you consider blocking the sunlight from those trees to help offset the foliar? Stimulation? Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, depending on, right? I just talked with a client in New York. His cold shelter is uh, 28 degrees, and his Chinese quince is leafing out. And he's like, what do I do? When we were in Japan for the kokufu, Japanese quince, it's called bokeh. Bokeh means to forget, right? Japanese quince would be budding out in mid-December. They'd be trying to flower in early January, right? So for the Kokufu exhibition, we had to lock them inside a dark, pitch black, dark box and fill it with ice every day. That's how we kept them from flowering until the Kokufu exhibition in February. For ume, for the, the plum, for sakura, the cherry, we would have to shut them in dark boxes in the Tokyo region, shut off the light, and pack them with ice. This was the only way to keep it from happening, because just ice and light, they would grow. Just, just uh, temperature, no light, they would still grow. Okay, so it's a very interesting conundrum. Did you have a question here? Yeah. Okay, we're gonna end with you and then we're gonna move on because we got some other stuff we wanna do. Maybe I missed it, I'm not sure. The little thing with the foam right there, you would normally have pumice in there, right? Yeah, this is pumice. This is and it's three to four inches thick or three inches thick? So we want a thickness that allows us to settle the container into the pumice, have some of that pumice around the container. And that's a really good question, okay? We've got this container in the pumice. We want the pumice to mound up around this container, and we want a small layer between that container and the bottom of the mat. One, it protects the mat. Number two, it holds a lot more heat here with the moisture. And here, this prevents the heat from escaping, so we make sure it gets into the container, right? Really good question. OK, heat beds, we got it.
Matt uh, wants to know how you treat the soil surface for the winter months. Ah, this is a good one, right? Uh, how do you treat the soil surface for the winter months? Let's, let's talk about that. We got to talk about dormant sprays. Uh, and we can talk about soil surface treatments to potentially preserve the, the integrity of our soil structure. We'll talk about that when, we, when everybody comes back. Come on, everyone, let's take our seats, please. If you have questions, George Biddle's going to have the microphone, so wait for him to get to you. What else you got, Deeds? Um, Derek is wondering if the key to watering in the winter is keeping the pumice on the top always wet. Not necessarily the pumice on the top, and in fact, the key to knowing, right? When we're using this heat bed situation, knowing when we need to water hinges on watching the, the, the pumice that's in contact with our container dry out, right? And that's a major, major indicator. Now, here's the thing. We're talking about kind of a multifaceted uh, aspect of winter care when, we, when we're talking about watering, okay? And how do we know that our tree needs water in the wintertime? And this kind of uh, dovetails very beautifully into how we preserve our soil structure in this freeze-thaw, freeze-thaw condition, okay? How do we know that it needs water? How can you guys tell that it needs water in the wintertime? Stick your finger in it. But it's always going to be wet. Almost always it's going to be wet, right? All the way to the bottom, that could be a pretty deep. You must have a long finger. I don't know. It depends on how big your tree is, right? OK. So this idea of top dressing, we always talk about top dressing in terms of, oh, OK, we put this, this coating or this protective layer over our, our soil surface. It holds the soil in place keeps moisture at the upper surface so that we get surface roots developing, right? But one of the things that we never talk about with top dressing is the fact that in the winter time, when we're applying winter care, this top dressing, because transpiration is at a minimum, environmental conditions are not pulling water out of the foliage, right? And the movement of water is happening so slowly, this top dressing starts to become an indicator of dryness, right? Allowing that water to move very slowly and evenly through that soil column, distributing that moisture, okay? Now this is beautiful too, because when we come back to top dressing, this top dressing also becomes a protective barrier where we see the top dressing experience the heaving of the freeze, thaw, freeze, thaw, freeze but the soil immediately below it is protected from that immediate rise and fall, expansion and contraction of that condition, and we see our soil maintain its structure far better over the winter season with the protection of top dressing, okay? So how can we protect top dressing from the beginning of that tree's life in that container becomes a massive tool to help that tree endure a lot of the issues that impact that soil environment across the season, even into the freezing of winter, right? OK, you guys ready to change gears? Yeah, all right. Any other pressing, necessary, absolutely can't live without pieces of knowledge for winter care? We've People want to make sure you're going to come back to dormant sprays. Ah, dormant sprays. Dormant sprays. I'm going to come back to it. I want to do some work, though. So let me, let me do some work. To get my hands dirty. We'll come back to dormant sprays to kind of wrap it all up. Dormant sprays. Don't let me forget. OK, so one of the beautiful things about this time of year, right, is that we don't have a lot to do. One of the worst things about this time of year, once we've tucked our trees in, we don't really have a lot to do. You know, it's like as bonsai people, we're, we start to realize how compulsive and crazy we are and how fidgety we get when we don't have tiny trees to be taken care of every day, okay? And so when we enter that dormant period of the year for a lot of our temperate trees, we have an entire genre of tree that we can start to pull out of sort of the depths of our garden that's maybe been neglected or needed to grow or wasn't time to be working on it over the fall and all of our other trees. This is the Mediterranean sort of variety of tree, right? And when we think about Mediterranean, we can even extend that just to, in general, the coastal varieties of trees, 
that we have in our collections, okay? And one of the biggest ones that we utilize in bonsai, the Procumbens juniper, okay? So if any of you guys have a large quantity of trees, a lot of your Procumbens probably tucked on the back bench look very, very similar to this, right? Ah, sorry, buddy. I didn't get to you today, okay? And I wanted to come back and just talk about how do we go about addressing a tree that's gotten to be so overgrown. How do we break into it? How do we clean it? How do we treat it at this time of year to regain some of that structure? What are the pruning decisions? What are the cleaning decisions, et cetera? So I've already kind of started cracking into this uh, impenetrable sort of uh, amount of foliar mass. And I just want to walk you guys through a little bit of my process because this does happen a lot at Bone Time Mariah. We have a lot of trees. They don't always get pruned when they need to. Um, and so we have to reclaim the shape of trees a lot. Now, where do we start the process? Just in terms of this tree hasn't been touched for a long time, where do we start the process of re-engaging with this tree? Okay, bottom branches, maybe first branches, and even more important than that, the bottom of the bottom branches, right? The place that we can get to the easiest that we know foliage does not belong. So when I come into this and I'm looking at this tree, I've got all of this stuff hanging across the bottom of the tree. I'm going to be coming in here, and I'm just going to be slowly taking this off. And as I identify shoots that exist above it that are still laying down laterally, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to snip off those bottom growing pieces. Okay? And this, this is a very, very easy way, particularly if you guys have been kind of stuck in the wintertime or, or your focus has been on getting everything prepared in your garden or the holidays and you haven't gotten around to your trees, very, very easy, convenient way to start coming back to your trees and re-entering the work process, right? So we can start on those bottoms. Now, what's next? What's next? We do those bottoms, and we say, oh, OK, all right, I'm starting. I see that differentiation in the branches, right? I'm going to come in here. I'm going to rotate this towards you guys, OK? Notice how this is just this thick mass. I'm just going to come in here, and I'm going to take these pieces off of the bottom, and it starts to reduce. Notice how that just starts to reduce the height of that. You see that? Isn't that wild? Uh, where would we start? Where do we start? I don't know. I don't know. Go to the bottom. Go to the bottom. Those are never going to be the branches that you want to keep. Let's go to the bottom. Let's start reducing some of that foliar mass. Okay. Now, after we start to get that clean line established, now where do we go? The bottom of the next one. Okay, so we could do bottoms of the whole tree, but then we're going to be like, well, now I got to go back and I got to do something else, right? What comes after bottom? OK, we talk about the inside, maybe. What about tops? When we start to talk about branch structure, and we've got this beautiful branch laid out here, OK, and we got our branchlets here, do we like branches that grow like that, straight out of the top? What happens with those branches? Why don't we like those branches? Because don't we want this pad to be like this? Doesn't this help this pad be like that? Not really. Not really, right? What actually creates this? Laterals. Laterals, OK? So we come back, and one thing that you guys will notice, I'll just rotate this towards you, notice all the white spots off of the tops of these branches. You see that? Where all those branches are being removed off the top of the pad, OK? And this is going to happen when a tree gets let to go, because now it's saying, oh, he forgot about me? I get to be a big tree now, right? And it explodes, and they're going to all grow towards the sunlight. So I'm going to come in here. I'm going to take a really close look, and I'm going to start taking off these really strong, vertically growing pieces. These become my next target to reclaim and regain the shape of this tree, OK? And when we're pruning now, Right? And particularly on a percumbens, so a lot of people have always asked me, how do you prune a percumbens? How do you keep a per percumbens tight? How do you keep a percumbens ramified? With a percumbens, we always have junctions and nodes. You guys know about percumbens, right? We've all dealt with percumbens. This is the bonsai of all bonsai. Okay, when we're looking at this percumbens, we've got nodes of growth here. Now, notice how long this guy is, right? There's no node on that piece of growth from the tip down to the bottom that piece automatically comes off. When we're looking here, we've got this big tuft up here, and we've got some smaller nodes down below. We can cut there. We've got another node here. We can cut there, and we greatly reduce that length and lighten that load. Okay? 
Or maybe we say, gosh, that's still a little bit too long. All right, let's cut back to the next branch, okay? No note on that, oh cool, okay. Let's cut back to the next branch. Ooh, look at how tight that is right there, right? And look at how tight this next one is too. Ah, oh, but this is still a little bit long. Cool, we've got a node right there. Let me take that guy off. Ah, oh, and this one's a little bit long. Great, we've got a node right there. So you see how we just slowly step down the length of this incrementally without cutting here, right? That's a no-no. We don't do that on Procumbens junipers. Now, if you do that, it's going to live. This is exactly why we can bring this tree into the workshop at this time of year and not worry about its durability or susceptibility to suffering from working on it right now. This is literally the most forgiving species we've ever found in bonsai culture. And for some reason, all of us think, yeah, no, uh, why would I want Procumbens? It's too compact, it's too uh, beautiful, tight foliage, it's too durable, it bends really easy, I can cut virtually all of the roots off of it, it tolerates heat, it tolerates cold, wind doesn't seem to affect it, if I don't fertilize it, it still grows. I hate that tree. <laughs> <laughs> what do you got, Alan? I find it to be very susceptible. Very susceptible to wind and freezing. Wow, that's interesting. I've never, ever had a procumbens even flinch, but that, that, there you go, right? Different spaces, different, different uh, cultivation, different microclimates. I've had them lined up in next to a plastic wall, and the, the end of the wall was open, and they would die. The one that was closest to the, the opening would die. Next one would be severely damaged. Next one would be slightly less damaged and back that way. The only juniper I found that's totally indestructible is the San Jose. San Jose, the San Jose. Well. That's another story. So I've had the exact same experience with the San Jose. Really? Yeah, yeah. I, I have not had good luck with San Jose. There you go. There you go. But this is, also, this is also to say, uh, you're talking with the only person that's ever killed an olive, OK? <laughs> right? I have killed an olive. So I definitely recognize I've got chinks in the armor. Maybe your procumbens is, is like your olive, OK? Gary wants to know if this tree will need special winter care. Yeah, so this is the question, right? I'm going to do this big, heavy reduction. Now, if you're Alan Taft, yes. Okay, if you're Alan Taft, <laughs> this tree is going to need special winter care. At Bonsai Mirai, I'm going to put it right back out on the bench. I've never had a Procumbens juniper suffer. Now, that's not to say, and this is a good conversation to have, you know, talking about the durability of the species. You can never overassume that a tree is uh, indomitable, right? I mean, you, there are conditions that will impact every single species of tree. In my garden, procumbens have been re really the strongest species I've ever dealt with, and it's a kind of a commonality. The reason in Japan that these are very lowly valued as bonsai trees, and that, let me tell you, there are magnificently uh, tortured, collected procumbens junipers in the Japanese landscape, right? I mean, fantastic yamadori. Some of the best yamadori I've seen was procumbens, and still they're not valued, right? And still they're not valued, because it's easy. Mr. Kimura used to tell me it basically grows itself. What's the, what's the skill in that, right? I kind of thought, but isn't that, what we, isn't that what we want? It's like, you know, like, <laughs> aren't we looking for small needles and strong? And, uh, and then, you know, coming to the Pacific Northwest, there's an interesting experience that I've had being here, because we almost have our own variety of procumbens. What, what is it in the Pacific Northwest? It basically grows itself. OK, this is just my experience, clearly. The mountain hemlock. Mountain hemlock, right? I mean, how much wiring do you have to do on a mountain hemlock to make it look, right? They create their own pads. They just slowly amass. I mean, it, a mountain hemlock over three or four years will look exactly like this, and just a mass of foliage, right? You get them, and they're these long, spindly things, and then they just start pro proliferating foliage and foliage and foliage and foliage and foliage. No, you're different. You're I'm, Alan, we're striking out, buddy. No, no. My, my observation is um, when I first got into bonsai here in the 80s, it, it was magical if you could keep a mountain hemlock alive. Uh huh. And I, th I believe now that I think about it, it's just soil. Or timing. Uh, or timing. Or timing, right? Or timing. Yeah, you know, now that we have Randy, he can go out and pick something off of a rock any time of year, it seems like, and it grows for him. Yeah, but yeah, we can't. Where, where normal people can't do that. 
you can't look at Randy as the as the sample, right? There's no. some some people just have the, the the gift of the green thumb. That guy's got it. So Sujata wants to know how much foliage reduction uh, in general you can go for in, in cucumbins. So so what yeah, what dictates that number? What dictates that number? How much foliage can we reduce in a procumbent? Strength of the tree? Okay. So if we have a weak tree, would we be doing this work or should we be doing this work? No, no, right? So then what dictates how much we can reduce? And think about, think about, let me just stop you before you guys start blurting out more random thoughts, okay? <laughs> think about what we've talked about over the course of this. This is where everything that we've gone through you guys now apply. When somebody asks that question, when you guys have that question, Sujata, when you ask yourself that question, think about this. What dictates that quantity? Okay, well, this is the strength of the tree is a very nebulous concept, right? Oh, strong tree, I can remove what, 50%? 90%? No? Yes? What do you got, Scott? The root system, he says, the container system, right? And how many roots it has here that need to be maintained by this foliage mass. Now, this is interesting, right? Because if we have a very small root system with this robust of a canopy, is this tree using a lot of water or not? Do you think that this is hard to keep this tree watered with this amount of foliage? Yeah. Absolutely. This is a nightmare, right? This is Troy's worst dream, OK? Now, now that we're coming back into the, the reduction process, though, and we're looking at this tree and we're saying, all right, let's go ahead and, and let's do some work on it. How much can I take this back? The small root system on this says 90%, no problem, no problem. Because ultimately what it comes down to is, do I have enough foliage to be moving water through this system so I maintain the balance of water and oxygen that allows the roots to thrive, right? Health is sourced from the roots. We're going to come back to it in January. Every time I see you guys, I'm going to be like, balance of water and oxygen, Diane. Joe, balance of water and oxygen. How you been? Okay? Because that is the most important concept we can have for health in our trees. We tend to look at all of this manipulation, and it's like, oh my gosh, he's taking off so much foliage. It's this big ball. Is it going to die? Is it going to die? This is the only thing that matters right here. That's the only thing that matters. Okay, so if this were in three times the pot, I might be able to remove 30% of the foliage. Okay? If it were in half the size of the pot, I might be able to remove 50%. In this pot, 90%, no issue. What do you got? So uh, how do you know what the strength of the roots are? Do you need to take it out of the pot and look? Or that's, a, that's, that's, a good, that's a good question. How do you know what the strength of the roots are? What is a good indication of the strength of the roots when we look at a tree? Foliage. Why? Why do you say that, Paul? Why do you say foliage is a, a good indicator of the strength of the roots? Talk to me about that. Well, if you have strong roots, you'll have a mirror image up in the foliage. Beautiful. I love it. I love what you're saying. You're, you're preaching gospel here. So when we look at this, and I look at this foliar mass, and I look at the growth that this tree put on, this is telling me, hey, the balance of water and oxygen that we've struck in this container is spot on. You nailed it, right? Not only did you nail it, you went above and beyond. Thank you for your efforts. I'm going to give you an award, okay? And that award is, now you got more to work with, create with, and build a bone tie out of, okay? So this foliage mass, now think about this. When we talk about, and we're dealing with this in the winter, now what did we say last time in terms of winter preparation? We've talked about it on multi-flush pines. If we choose to do shoot selection on, on our multi-flush pines, what do we need to be careful of? If we do shoot selection on multi-flush pines, what do we need to be careful of? Cold, right, we gotta be careful of cold. Why? Okay, we've opened up airflow. We've removed a lot of resources, right? We've pulled a lot of sugars and starches out of the tree, okay? So automatically, that's saying, listen, when we reduce the foliage mass, right, we start to decrease the quantity of strength in the tree, okay? But when we start to talk about that too, we also are considering that balance of water and oxygen as a major aspect of how that tree's relating after we reduce that foliage mass. So one of the biggest things about black pines in the Pacific Northwest Beyond cold is too much water, not enough oxygen in the roots over the winter time as a, as a result of the shoot selection. So if I were concerned about this procumbens, would I be concerned about cold or would I be concerned about water? I'm going to say my biggest concern would actually be water 
as the major limiting factor of whether this can go outside or not. And for this tree in this pot, I feel pl plenty safe about that. Okay, so you guys see how that's coming back together just slowly but surely? And notice all that we've taken off already. This is crazy, right? Okay, so if you guys have a spare moment, right? You're getting the itch, Christmas dinner, got nothing to do for coming in the back of the greenhouse, pull it in. Start at the bottom. Once you get those bottoms cleaned and you see that starting to get some definition, come back into those tops, prune back to nodes throughout the interior of the tree, rebuild that Procumbens juniper. It's one of the best trees we could be working with. It's so forgiving. It loves you. Christmas season, right? Give the gift of giving. Work on your Procumbens. Okay. Last one for the night. How are we doing on time? We're good. It's about 8.20. 8.20. Woo. Ah, dormant spray. You guys were supposed to remind me, but I remembered. To spray or not to spray? That is the question. Tonight, that's the question. Paul is saying spray, spray, nuke them, get them, right? To spray or not to spray? How do you make that decision? What do we use? Why do we do it? What the heck is going on? Okay, Alan says if we see the presence of diseases or insects, we're going to spray. Okay, I think this is legitimate, right? Is it preemptive, Doug asks? Let's get there. And, and, and we're saying... We spray in order to protect. So we're saying we spray to pr protect, to, to prevent. Now let me ask you guys something before we get to you, Scott. Does spraying kill the good with the bad? Oh, shoot. Okay, what do you got, Scott? For me, a big question is uh, between deciduous and conifers. Aha, deciduous and conifers. Is there a difference, right? And not only that, but inside conifers, is there a difference? That's a big one, okay? All right, let's just talk about this really quickly. In, in relation to the cultivation of bonsai, we need to have thresholds, right? We need to have thresholds. Typically, when we start using a dormant spray, we are reaching a population of insects that is recurring over on an annual cycle, and we need to break that occurrence from taking place, okay? So when we talk about dormant sprays, we are interrupting the reproductive cycle, okay? We're interrupting that reproductive cycle. Now, the problem with dormant sprays is they're non-selective, right? They kill the good, they kill the bad, they kill things that weren't even involved, they were like, I'm not involved, oh, right? I, didn't, I don't know, I don't, mm. Okay, so we don't want to necessarily be knocking down all of our beneficial insects, microorganisms, bacteria, et cetera, every single season and trying to rebuild that over the course of the next year. We think because we're taking out the bad insects, all of our, all of our worries are gonna be you know, completely eliminated. Spores and disease are cycling through the air. Insects, eggs, webs, spider mites, aphids, they're all over the place. We can't stop them. We've tried so hard to stop insects. We've nuked our environment trying to stop insects, right? But in our small ecosystems, when we start to get this reoccurring population, it means that there is a reproductive ground that's occurring. This is when dormant sprays start to become a good thing to start looking at to break that cycle. Same with diseases. When we have a disease that's starting to show a lot of prevalence, it's spreading. We can't stop it by preventative treatments in the spring, treating that new growth that's most susceptible. It keeps happening, it keeps happening, it keeps happening. This would be a consideration where we might look to dormant sprays to mitigate that spread. Okay, But bear in mind this too. If you have a high susceptibility to an insect, if you have a high susceptibility to a disease, it's telling you something about your tree. What's it telling you? We got a problem. We have a problem. Because every single tree, right, has a very strong immunity to predators and disease. Right, one of the biggest lessons I've learned over seven years at Bonsai Marai in the Pacific Northwest, the king of the disease capital of horticulture, right, is that if I have a healthy tree, I don't have to deal with disease. Right? It's a fundamental, consistent, recycling, universal theme that I have come to accept. I understand it now. If I got needle cast on my pine, I got an unhealthy tree. Somehow. Now, is it, do I pull it out, repot it, try to fit? No. No. 
Maybe I watered it too much over the course of the fall. Maybe it needs to be tilted up. Maybe it needs to be pulled out of the moisture. Maybe I plucked too many needles off of it and I threw off that transpiration that was maintaining that balance. I need to fix that. These are small changes, small changes, okay? Dormant sprays. If we decide we gotta break that cycle, reproductive cycle, we're gonna break it. What are we gonna use and why and how and who said? Whoa, who said? What are we using? Lime sulfur. Let's talk about lime sulfur. What does lime sulfur do? How does it work? Whoa. Easy. Caustic. Caustic, right? pH of lime sulfur, super basic. We put that baby on the tree. Any spores, any eggs, any overwintering living organism, done. Gone. Gonzies, right? Takes care of it through caustic action. Now, how in the world can we apply that to a tree and the foliage mass of a tree and have that foliage survive? By doing it when it's cold? What happens when it's cold? What is, why does that matter? Not as active? Stomata are slightly closed, very good. And the cuticle is far thicker. The cuticle of the foliar mass is far thicker, okay? The reason we can get away with applying lime sulfur on our conifers is because of that waxy coating or that cuticle. Now, here's one of the interesting things. There was a chemical company that used to make lime sulfur. They also made Volk oil, right? This is back in the late 90s, okay? And they recommended a tank mix. Tank mix your Volk oil with lime sulfur. This is the dormant spray of the future, right? What happened? Let's first talk about dormant oil, right? So we got lime sulfur, and then we got dormant oil. One question on lime sulfur. Yeah, we'll come back to it. Okay. How does dormant oil work? Smothers, smothers, suffocates, right? Oil. So insects, the way that they breathe, they don't have a, well, they do have a mouth, but that's not how they breathe, right? Did you guys know that? Insects don't breathe through their mouth? This is like Jeopardy. Where do they breathe through? Sure, 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 right? They got these holes that go directly to their organs, right? And that oil clogs that baby up, okay? So we're smothering, we're suffocating, we're suffocating the spores, we're suffocating the eggs, we're suffocating the insects. Yes, I love this. Can we suffocate the tree? Ooh, this is interesting, right? This is now interesting. So when we're in the dormant portion of the year, we have less gaseous exchange because there's less metabolic activity, right? What else does the oil do, though? Suspenza, we'll come back to the lime sulfur mixture. Let's just talk about the oil, right? What else does oil do? What does it do to the plant? What does it do to the surface area of the plant? Dissolves that cuticle. It dissolves the cuticle. I'm a chemical company. Mix my oil with my lime sulfur, you're never going to have to spray dormant spray again. Yeah, that's, that's correct, because your plants are going to be dead. That's right. That's right. And so what happened? Lawsuit after lawsuit after lawsuit, and you don't see that label anymore, okay? Dormant oil, when we start to talk about it, great for deciduous trees, great for very thick cuticle conifers. For example, our pines, the outer area of the wind, right? Not so good for our high surface area thinner cuticles like the fat and happy junipers that now no longer have that tight compact foliage anymore. Dormant oil has shown to be fairly dangerous if we're not careful and we don't experiment, we don't understand our environment, we could cr create problems. Spruce, hemlock, larch, fir, these are trees that are all susceptible if they still are in needle, for the larch anyways, to dormant oils if they're applied incorrectly at the wrong time, too hot, too windy, right? Or in an overabundance or too high of concentration, okay? So if in doubt, lime sulfur gives us the most dependable sort of long-lasting, time-tested solution for a dormant spray, right? Turns your trees maybe a slightly white, Leaves a residue on the uh, container of the tree. Okay. If you have to interrupt that cycle, that's a small sacrifice. All right? Dormant oils, definitely an option. Heavy cuticle plants, deciduous trees, smother, awesome. Anything else, let's go ahead and do some samples. Test it out and see how those trees behave before we treat our best trees in our collection with it. Okay? Understand? We need a mic over here. Douglas is wondering if spraying the foliar mass in the tree with lime sulfur also takes care of the spores on the sur uh, soil surface. Oh, uh, on the spores on the soil surface. So we don't want to be spraying the surface of the soil super heavily, but you're obviously going to get some residue unless you cover it. 
Any contact is caustic. So if they're on the immediate surface, they would experience some of the action of lime sulfur, absolutely. I know we've had a little tussle on this, but my feeling at this point, having done it, is washing the, the foliage hard gets rid of all that. Ah. Gets rid of the spores, gets rid of the back. They have to start somewhere. Mm. So they land on the branch of the foliage, and if you get rid of them by washing them off, you mm. don't have any of this problem, and you don't run into the problem with killing your tree with chemicals. You know, the thing about it, though, Paul, is nature got smart long, long ago. Uh -huh. <laughs> right? And those spores, they stick. And those eggs, they stick. Have you guys ever seen a needle lined with aphid eggs or adelgid eggs? Have you ever seen that? Yeah. What do you do about that, right? That's the problem. So if that were the case in the Pacific Northwest, we would not have disease issues. Because our foliage gets washed off a lot, right? I'm not, yeah, 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 I'm yeah. just throwing it out there, right? OK, anyways. Uh, uh, I, I, I'm oh. just, let me, let me yeah. just follow. I, I tried it for two seasons, uh -huh. and I had no disease. Huh. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. That's, that's legitimate, right? Let's go here, and then we'll hit you guys in the back. We got a boom, 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 ladder to Doug. What dilution rate do you use for your lime sulfur? Because I've Ooh. seen any, anywhere from like uh, 1 to a 25 to 1 to 50. Troy, what'd they tell you? The tree. One pint per half gallon? Was that what it was? One pint per half gallon. That's what they said. Now, this is where it starts. A pint per half. Don't quote me on that. I shouldn't have said anything. I'm sorry. I don't have a label in front of me. Stop it. I don't know. I don't know. Let's start there. I have no idea. Clearly, I shouldn't have said that. Don't, you guys don't take that to heart. I don't know. I don't know. I'd have to read the label. I, Troy called the chemical company. He and I wrestled with it. He sprayed his pomegranate. It seems like it worked. I don't know what to tell you. Though the label didn't have the dilution ratio on it. Man, if in doubt, call the chemical company. That's their job. You realize that they have to answer that phone. They're legally required to answer that phone. Put them to work, man. They, they have to. Yeah, and they do, and they're great. A lot of times they're great, right? If they're not public-facingly great, they're in a whole world of hurt. They're a chemical company. What do you got, Doug? So uh, due to the caustic nature of the lime sulfur, is moss sort of one of those collateral damage situations? Could be. Could be, depending on the concentration that you spray with. Now, this is another thing, because when you ask about concentration, concentration is a variable thing, depending on what is the percentage of actual lime sulfur in solution, and also what is, you know, manufacturer recommendations based on what they've experienced as potentially phytotoxic doses. Now, in Japan, whatever the label says, they, like, triple it. Okay, so you just get these, like, white trees that in the springtime, it's like white dust, you know, it turns your snot black. That was very common for us to get client trees that did that. I, that's a, another reason that I'm not a proponent of it, but I do see its purpose. Um, so, you know, uh, moss could, if strong enough, be a residual damage, absolutely. Uh, Prunus mume, shot hole fungus. Shot hole fungus. <sighs> I got nothing for you. Is this from the shot hole borer? Apparently, ah. just little holes in all of the leaves, and right, then they right. fall off. Oh, from all in all of the leaves. Yeah, yeah, it's a leaf issue. Interesting. I, I've never heard of that. Huh? It's very common. Totally. Uh, uh, okay. Let Apricot me do some research. Prune. Let me do some research. January. Ask me that question again, please. Okay. Okay. Thanks. What's that? All the pit fruits. Shot hole fungus. Got it. Got it. It's not called botrytis? OK, good. Shot hole fungus. Can you, can you write that one down? Shot hole fungus? We got to get that. Anybody else? What do we got online? Uh, Kim wants to know about scale. Scale. What about scale? What do we want to know about scale? Uh, what, what do you use instead of um, ethyl alcohol and a Q-tip? Uh, <laughs> So it depends on the species, right? But if we're trying to get rid of scale, how do you get rid of scale? Do you use lime sulfur? Do you use dormant oil? Do either of them work? Systemic can work. Dormant oil will work. Lime sulfur? No? Not on scale? So? Eh. You do it by hand? 
We know that dormant oil will suffocate them, right? In Japan, at those ratios, scale stood no chance. Maybe not here, right? Maybe not here, OK? Uh, when we talk about, though, when we start to see a reoccurring problem, and we're talking about this reoccurring problem, what is the number one thing that lime sulfur started to be utilized to control? Do you guys know? OK, so you say peach leaf curl in terms of bonsai, in terms of bonsai, in terms of bonsai. Spider mite. Spider mite. It was meant to stop the reoccurring uh, cycles of spider mite in Japan. That's why they started using it so prevalently on their bonsai, to break the cycle of spider mite. Right? So when you start to see, you go through Japan, you see spider mite becoming these mutant strength, resistant to all chemicals because they're having to spray so much and it's a prevalent issue. Lime sulfur is the way that a lot of gardens break that cycle, okay? the eggs of spider mites. All right, let's dive into, oh, we got one more? One, yeah. more, one more question. Is, lime sulfur is so alkaline. Even if you're protecting your soil in applying it, right. does it end up affecting the pH of the soil? So Could. That you ought to do something to try to restore the acidity. Um, I don't know if it would affect it to the degree where you would need to restore the acidity, but there are a lot of issues regarding lime sulfur that make it a concern, right? Interestingly enough, though, you don't see a lot of people that spray lime sulfur protect the soil surface. And you don't see a lot of places that spray lime sulfur have health impacts as a result of it. And I still haven't figured out how that works. So um, you know, as far as that's concerned, good question. I would like to know more myself. OK? All right? Dormant, dormant, so we got one more back here. All right, we're going to stop with you, sir. You guys haven't ever asked me if I've used dormant spray at Mariah. I just have a couple comments. I was a licensed uh, Cool. Pesticide applicator for yes. a number of years. What do you got? The deal with both of these. Uh huh. Uh, lime sulfur. You got to be careful what you put it on. So, the most important thing if you're going to use that uh, for either insects or disease prevention is to uh, get to know whether or not it's safe for your plant. Okay. That's the biggest. Experimental issue. for phytotoxicity. Okay. And I'll give you one example. I had a quince that I sprayed one time during the dorm season, and uh, but uh, you know quince keep their hold their leaves. Well, not if you spray them with lime sulfur. Right, right. It came back, but it, you know, with the dormant oil, the most important thing for insect control, uh, excuse me, for uh, scale control, is timing. Almost all scale, I think, come out of their shell right. at a particular time of year right. to go move. Crawlers, yeah. Usually very early spring, late summer, early spring. Okay. So you need to know, if you're going to use the oil for that, you need to know well, also whether it's Phytotoxic, but you right. also want to make sure that you spray while the insects are out crawling. Right, hit which, that time of year. Yeah, know, that every makes... year is different. It's it's difficult, but if you actually go out there and look every day when you know it's about to come and you know you got the problem, then you can time it better. Makes sense. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. Makes a lot of sense. So, and coming back to that quince, don't treat deciduous trees and leaf with lime sulfur. Don't do that. Okay, because they don't have that cuticle, right? And again, coming back to that concept of the cuticle. All right, Mediterranean species, coast live oak. Love it, love it, love it, love it. What do you guys know about a coast live oak? How do we handle them? When do we do what we do, and why do we do it? Give me a little bit of knowledge about Quercus agrifolia. Anything. Do you guys have anything? Is it cold tolerant? Not very, kind of, maybe, no. We said not very, no. Bob, have you? No, no, definitely not, right? We need to protect Quercus agrifolia. Now, can they freeze? Let's talk about that. Can Quercus agrifolia freeze? Yes. yes, it can freeze. It can take a light freeze, right? So when we start getting into Quercus agrifolia and we start saying, can it freeze? Is it winter tolerant? Every tree has some degree of tolerance, unless we're talking about a tropical like a buttonwood, right? Every tree has some degree of tolerance. Again, I've seen Quercus agrifolia take uh, downwards of 2 degrees Fahrenheit. I've seen Quercus agrifolia, just the same as I say for redwoods, I've seen it die at 32 degrees, OK? What impacts, when we start talking about our Mediterranean varieties, what impacts their cold tolerance? Do you guys have any idea? OK, strength of the roots. What impacts the strength of the roots? OK, or the foliage mass, which is you know, kind of what, what we had gotten to. You guys, got, you, got, you guys got to take this stuff away from here. Don't, don't let me down. Not in the home stretch. We're almost there, right? We've re-educated, re OK? 
So we're saying the more foliage mass that this tree has on it, the more cold tolerant it is. So we did an experiment over the past three years, right? Every single year we would leave out this one uh, Quercus agrifolia, this coast live oak. We weren't super fond of it. Uh, we, we wanted to see what they could tolerate. We had never ever pruned the tree, right? We'd never pruned the tree. So we left it outside two degrees, 10 degrees, 15 degrees, 20 degrees, it never would die, okay? We had another oak sitting right next to it that we would heavily prune. 28 degrees, it died. So when we start looking at this sort of phenomenon that we're talking about, is it cold tolerant, is it not? One of the things, according to winter care, that we all need to be understanding of is the more foliar mass, the more cold tolerant something is. The more root mass, the more cold tolerant something is, right? The more trunk mass, the more cold tolerant something is, the more branch mass, the more cold tolerant something is. Why is that? Come back again to the fundamental concepts of what this tree's been doing over the fall. Close the gap for me of what that's gonna, what's gonna, that's gonna do and how that's gonna work next spring. And with that, we're gonna wrap up sort of our, our, our BSOP series for 2017. Come, come back to me now. Why? More foliage, more mass, more roots. What's that? Okay, we're putting more antifreeze. And Lee, what is the form of that antifreeze? Sugars and starches. Sugars and starches, right? We're talking about the things that are produced via photosynthesis are what's creating that tolerance, right? So the more foliage we have, the more vascular tissue over the fall season is created, right? We know that. This is what, what dictates. When we prune and we have the leaves of our Japanese maples over the fall season, we get finer twigs. Do you guys remember that conversation? You remember that? We did that with the Zelkova. We wanted finer twigs on the Zelkova. We cut those leaves in half, lower surface area, finer twigs, lower production of vascular tissue, right? And we say, if we want new roots to form or we're gonna be repotting next season, we're gonna leave more foliage mass because that foliar mass is gonna create new vascular systems, okay? And we say, all of those sugars and starches are being stored where? Vascular system, excellent. Roots, trunk, branches, okay? And then what does that stored energy do next season? That's the epicenter of all of that new foliage mass that we get to utilize. Now, let's, let's keep this going because this is really, really beautiful, okay? We get that first flush or that push out of growth next season. How do we handle that, that growth? How do we handle that growth? What are we concerned with? How do we make sure that we maintain that tree's strength? Do we want to eliminate that growth? No, no, right? What do we want to do? Allow it to elongate, open, harden, and get back to a what? Energy positive. Very good. Now, there are some trees that we've been pinching over the course of the year. We didn't let that growth harden off. Why was that possible on a tree we were pinching? It's in a refinement phase. And what does that mean for the needle mass that it's holding from last year? In refinement means we probably have more needles, right? Have more needles, have more, more ramification. We're trying to refine the tree. So that needle mass that already exists takes the place of that energy from that open, harden, elongate energy positive. It keeps that engine going. So when we have a younger tree, a sparser tree, we have to let that foliage accumulate. When we have a fuller tree, we have the ability to maintain and guide that energy, and we have the older needles continuing to supplement, okay? Open, elongate, harden, energy positive. What can we do at this point in time in that late spring, early summer time frame? We can come back in and we can prune, right? We can come back in and we can take away that auxin that's suppressing that lateral bud growth, stimulate those buds on the interior that are there to put out two where there was one. Do we remember this? Okay. At the tail end of that spring into summer, what starts to happen? What's the transition? Okay, so we go into that dormant period and we start shifting from foliar to vascular. Very nice, right? And across the fall season, what is the tree's priority? Get ready for winter, storing energy, creating the vascular tissue that supports next season's foliar growth, okay? Towards the end of the winter, oh, let's talk about this. I forgot about this, I'm sorry. In the fall, if we want smaller needles, but we need to prune our pines, prune them earlier in the fall, later in the fall. You want finer growth. Think about this. It's accumulating energy, right? Accumulating energy. 
Ponderosa pines, we're going to prune them earlier, right? So when we get towards the end of the fall, are we going to be pruning? Are we going to be reducing foliage? Are we going to be tampering with that mechanism? No, no. Leaves start to turn color. Leaves start to fall off. What are we doing at that point if, uh, if it's a deciduous tree? We start to prune then, right? We know that we're not going to get bleeding if the temperatures are low on a Japanese maple as the most susceptible, right? Now all of a sudden we go into this dormant period. We're worried about what? Okay, we're protecting from desiccation. We're healing in. We're setting them on the ground. We're watching balance of water and oxygen and sensitive species go into the shelter. At this point in time, what can we, we be working on? Mediterranean varieties and procumbens junipers. That's it. That's all we got. A Mediterranean variety, you bet, Paul. Redwoods, we can do redwoods. Olives, Olives absolutely. Mediterranean varieties, guys. <laughs> so I'm headed to Italy tomorrow, 5 a.m. Whoa, right, right. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited. Ricardo will be going with me. <laughs> What'd you say? We're going to Italy to work on Mediterranean varieties. How does that sound? OK, and so with that, we've got sort of, I just wanted to bring the crown of this oak kind of bringing, uh, bringing, bringing tonight to a close. When we start talking about shaping and aesthetics, again, we haven't had a lot of shaping and aesthetics as a part of this conversation. We've been focused so much on the horticulture. You guys have a tremendous body of knowledge to refer to, to start answering some of your questions. Continue to think bonsai. If you're going to represent an oak well, first movement in the branch goes up or down. Why? What's that? The way deciduous and broadleaf evergreen trees, that's a coastal, coastal condition, right? So when we start looking at these Mediterranean varieties, just as an aesthetic to leave you guys with, up or down, something for you guys to play with. Any questions before we take off tonight, BSOP? We got one, we got one in the back. No, we, get, we need you in the mic. We need you on the mic. I just had a... That's one of my favorite trees, and I got a comment on it. I've tried to grow it over here for 40 years, in the ground and in pots. It never lasts very long, and there are none in the Hoyt Arboretum, mm. and there would be. Do you protect it in the wintertime, or you leave it outside? Outside. Ah, yeah. ah. Oh, well, if you protect gotcha. it, yeah. yeah. But if you're talking about winter hardy, that right. means you leave it outside. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. All right, there you go. Yeah. All right, very good. You guys got any questions? Is it the same as Chrysolepis? Was it the same as Chrysolepis? No, no. No, this is agrifolia. Got one more from Paul here. Don't all trees need to be protected during the winter? I mean, what would you really leave out? Maybe a larch? Like as bonsai, you mean? Yeah, because they're all in a weakened state. Why not protect them? Well, what's the downside? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, sure. I, I, all our trees go on the ground. Are you talking about protection like shelter or ground or? Everything. In other words, some people say, oh, just leave them out on the bench and they'll be okay. And I, I don't think so. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Paul. I agree with you. Uh, there's an interesting thing. David Benevente told me one time. He's a, a Spanish bonsai professional. He said if we were really doing bonsai at the highest level, every tree would go into a greenhouse. I thought that was a very interesting statement. I thought that was very interesting. I don't know that I agree with it, but I thought it was an interesting <laughs> statement. Okay, goes along with what you guys had. Hey, it's been a really stellar year for us, you guys. Uh, bonsai Mirai and Mirai Live has really flourished as a result of the BSOP community coming out and supporting. Uh, we can't thank you guys enough for it. We look forward to January meeting you guys one more time at the turn of the new year. Uh, give yourself a round of applause. Thank you very much. <laughs> Have an awesome holiday party. Happy holidays to you guys. Be safe. Bonsai hard. We'll see you guys next year.